This is one of the greatest masterpieces of Chinese landscape painting. Travelers among mountains and streams, painted by the artist Fan Quan in the 10th century AD. It was inspired by his wanderings in the unreal landscapes of Mount Hua, one of the five holy mountains of China. When Westerners first discovered Chinese paintings like this one, they could not see their value. They wouldn't even acknowledge them as art. But as Confucius noted, it is possible to look without seeing. If you learn to see beyond the surface of these paintings, you will discover their real beauty and find the deepest truths of the Chinese philosophies of life. Enter the hidden world of Chinese painting. What makes a Chinese painting so distinctive, so immediately recognizable as Chinese? Is it the subject matter that the Chinese artists chose to paint? Is it the different tools and techniques that they used? Or is it how they saw what they were looking at? How do we begin to understand this unique painting tradition which has survived virtually unchanged for so many centuries? Well, in China, they say to understand painting, you need to understand calligraphy, the art of writing Chinese characters with a brush. The two arts are considered inseparable, like twins at birth. To understand the birth of calligraphy in China, we need to go back 3,000 years, when Chinese holy men first began to make simple drawings on animal bones. When the bones were heated in a fire, the voice of heaven was revealed as the priests interpreted the meaning of the cracks that appeared. From the very beginning, writing in China was not just a way of communication between people, but also a means to connect with the spiritual world. When farmers in central China first found these ancient artifacts in the 1800s, they called them dragon bones, and they ground them into medicinal powders. But in the 1950s, a visiting scholar recognized them for what they were, the earliest examples of Chinese writing. By studying these bones, scholars began to understand how these pictographs carved into bone evolved over thousands of years into symbols painted with a brush. So at the beginning, the Chinese calligraphy is written in pictograph style, pictograph style. If you want to write a goat, there's a horn, two horns of the goat. Eh? And the cow is like this, eh? like this. So uh, each word, there is a meaning. Eh? This is the uh, sun, this is the moon, and this is, you see, like this. This is a bird, meow. You can't draw a picture of an abstract concept like good or old. And so, combinations of characters were created to express an idea associated with the meaning of both characters. These are called ideographs, because the character is not a picture of an object in the real world, but a symbol for an idea. Thus, the characters for sun and moon together came to mean bright. As Chinese characters are symbols for ideas, so elements in a Chinese landscape rocks, water, trees, and mountains became symbols of concepts such as longevity and perseverance. For example, 
Pine trees, as one ancient critic put it, are like people of high principles whose manner reveals an inner power. Indeed, one emperor bestowed the title of Mandarin of the Fifth Degree on a particularly ancient pine tree at the foot of a holy mountain. Bamboo, which flowers in winter and grows with measured stalks, is the symbol of strength against adversity, flexibility, and the character of an educated literary gentleman. So, for the Chinese, pictures painted with a brush, whether they be an ideograph, a tree, a rock, or a mountain, are symbols that carry both the surface meaning and additional hidden meanings that can be uncovered by the educated eye. Chinese paintings are not just pretty pictures. They mean something. But why was the symbolic nature of calligraphy carried over to the art of painting? Because in China, calligraphers and painters were usually the same men, men called mandarins, who were the ruling scholar officials of China. To understand traditional Chinese paintings, we need to understand the minds of these Mandarin artists who created them. Whereas in medieval Europe, nobles often bragged of their inability to read or write, the Mandarins were extremely literate men, living their lives with a writing brush in hand. Because they were the world's first bureaucrats, administrators of the huge centralized imperial system. This system was created by the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, when he ordered his ministers to create a standard ideographic writing system for all Chinese. With this common writing system, people from different parts of China could communicate in writing even though they spoke different dialects. In fact, the Chinese term for civilization, Wen Ming, is represented by the characters for literature and bright and so the term literally means enlightenment through literacy. Thus writing was doubly important to the mandarins. It was the stuff of both civilization and spirituality. And this was their shrine to the written word. The forest of stone tablets in the ancient capital of Xi'an. For many centuries, scholars from all over China and Asia would come here to the world's oldest bookstore to obtain copies of the great texts of the past. But before the age of printing, it wasn't a simple thing to get something to read. First, rice paper was placed over text carved into a tablet. Then the scholars would carefully stamp ink onto the paper. After peeling it off, they would have a negative copy of the text, which they would then roll up and pack away for the long trip home. A lot of trouble to go through to get your favorite manuscript. They came for copies of the work of the famous calligraphers, or for this dictionary of how to read old seal script characters, a kind of Chinese Rosetta stone. But mostly they came to copy the writings of a single humble teacher who lived in the 5th century BC, Confucius. This sage's ideas about man's role in society, his relation to his family, friends, and ruler, became the cornerstone of the imperial system. The essence of the philosophy expressed in the writings of Confucius was simply respect for established authority as a condition of peace and prosperity. Mastery of these writings was the only avenue to wealth, position, and power in traditional China. And so the Chinese ruling elite wasn't made up of generals, priests, and nobles, but of mandarins. To become a mandarin, you had to pass the rigorous imperial exams. The sons of upper-class Chinese families had to begin to prepare for these exams as soon as they were old enough to use a pair of chopsticks, memorizing and learning to reproduce the Confucian texts automatically, vividly, and in detail. Examinees would descend by the thousands to the imperial examination halls here in Nanjing, where just a few exam cells remain. 
Up until the last century, there were thousands upon thousands of exam cells here, covering a huge area. And here the examinees were tested on one subject only. The Chinese imperial examination system tested knowledge of these Confucian texts, and success or failure in that oldest of all civil service exams determined one's career in the Chinese imperial bureaucracy. Examinees would spend days writing down the classics from memory, eating and sleeping in their cells. Of course, sometimes their memories failed them, and the cheat sheet was born. Those who passed became mandarins. With this high office came power, wealth, and lots of paperwork. Mandarins spent most of their lives writing documents, often in multiple copies, in the square, official, regular script. So how was the art of calligraphy born out of this stiff, official writing? Well, these scholars, being human, had to occasionally escape the Confucian rigidity of their official lives. So they were attracted to another philosophy that was the opposite, yet the complement of Confucianism. Taoism, a philosophy that was to profoundly influence the art of the Mandarins. The Chinese philosophy of Taoism stresses man's relationship to nature, appealing to the artistic side of humankind. The Tao, or the Way, is the unseen reality behind appearances, the balanced cosmic flow of all things. The first aim of the Chinese artist was to express the perfect harmony of this unseen reality. In their heads Confucian, but in their hearts Taoist, Mandarins would escape to relax and write poetry in nature, or if that wasn't possible, in a garden. And in the year 323 AD, that's just what seven of these scholar officials did, gathering here on the side of a small stream at the Orchid Pavilion, the sacred shrine of Chinese calligraphy. These scholars were escaping from their highly structured official lives, relaxing, waxing lyrical, enjoying a cup of wine to loosen their inhibitions, and having philosophical discussions on the banks of this tiny stream. They were among the first of a long and honored tradition of drunken poets. One scholar was always accompanied by a servant carrying a bottle of wine and a spade with which to dig the scholar's grave. He declared, to a drunken man, the affairs of this world appear as so much duckweed in the river. After which he floated a cup of wine down the stream to his friend, Wang Xixue, a man who had no idea that he would be revered for all time by the Chinese as the father of calligraphy. In line with Taoist philosophy, the Mandarins looked to nature for inspiration. So, while Wang Xixue, a writer of the formal official script, sat meditating, his inspiration arrived with a honk. He was distracted by the natural flowing movements of geese in the pond, movements which he copied with his brush. And so the beautiful flowing grass script was born, raising calligraphy to an abstract art form. His characters, light as a floating cloud, vigorous as a startled dragon, were very different from those of the square, clearly defined official script. Wang Xixue's work is treasured not so much because of what was written, but in how the characters were written. His style embodies the Taoist concept of yin and yang, of everything containing in itself its opposite. The word you write with this brush, there must be yin yang. This is Taoist. Yin and yang. Horizontal stroke, horizontal stroke must be thin. Yin. Yin. This is yin. The yang is always thick and yin are always thin. Yang is yang. Yin, yang, 
yin. Likewise, in Chinese painting, the concept of yin yang can be found hidden in the composition. Neighboring trees have a guest host relationship, the host large and protective, the guest smaller and more modest in bearing. This host guest principle can be applied to the relation of rock to rock, mountain to mountain, or man to man. So great calligraphy or painting must have this sense of balance, of yin and yang, which the Mandarin so treasured. This is a good piece of calligraphy. Some moist, some dry, some thin, some thick, some big, some small, some big, and some fast, some slow. In both their lives and their art, they strove to attain a harmonious, balanced relationship between their roles as stern administrators and their more sensitive, artistic, Taoist spirit. No artist was better at doing this, at expressing his personality in his work, than a certain eccentric monk who lived during the ninth century, Zhang Shu. Legend has it that he would walk around drunk and sobbing until he sat down to perform some calligraphic magic. He allowed his brush to gallop across the paper, curling, twisting in one unbroken stroke. The novelty and quality and originality of his work had nobles lining up to buy a sample and emperors down the centuries scrambling to own some small piece of his genius. This is his work called Cure for Stomach Ache. It is highly polished by the rubbing of countless scholars who have copied it over the centuries. They copied it not because they suffered from stomach ache, but because they could see the indomitable spirit of the man reflected in the way he wrote his characters, making the crazy, wild, yet highly skilled calligraphy a treasured work of art. With Zhang Su, calligraphy became a visible expression of personality. The Mandarins inherited this concept of expressing feelings through artistic creation and adopted it for their own painting, most famously during the 14th century Yuan dynasty, when the native Chinese were conquered and ruled by the Mongols. During this time, the Mandarins, who normally would have served at court, found themselves at a loss for what to do, since the Mongols chose not to employ most of them to administer their newly conquered empire. Those scholar officials who were invited to serve faced a terrible dilemma. If they joined the new Mongol administration, they could be branded traitors. If they withdrew out of loyalty to the vanquished Chinese emperor and finished their lives in seclusion, they would be forced to support themselves and their families as best they could with their talents. Most chose the latter path. The best of them, however, did not. Chao Ming Fu became a high-ranking official in the Mongol court, and he was despised for it. Nevertheless, he became one of China's most famous artists. His emphasis on the blending of calligraphy, literature, and painting became the ideal for mandarins in later centuries. In this work, he made use of sparse and abbreviated brush strokes to express his loneliness and inner longing for the open countryside with its mountains and woods. It is an evocation of a state of mind whose symbolic meaning far outweighs its depiction of reality. Ni Zan, a highly educated man, took the opposite path by refusing office under the Mongols. He was forced to sell the family estate and thereafter lived on a boat on the lakes. He painted in light ink on paper with delicate, dry brushwork. Using crisply etched lines, his paintings depict scene after scene of desolate silence and loneliness. Pine trees on an island symbolize himself and his scholar friends. Asked why his paintings never show any figures, he answered, how can there be any human beings 
in this age of ours. For Ni Shan and most Chinese Mandarin painters after him, scenery was a state of mind. And if we look closely, we can also find the Confucian philosophy of the Mandarins in their paintings. Confucius taught respect for the authority of ancient masters, and so the scholar painters often followed the style of one of the great masters of an earlier period, sometimes copying them stroke for stroke. Forgery took on a new ambiguity. Artists were supposed to closely copy old masterworks. Thus, a Chinese painting from 100 years ago often looks very similar to one painted a thousand years ago. As you can imagine, having so many copies around made it difficult to tell an original from a fake. So Chinese painters often stamped their paintings with seals in red ink to guard against forgery. Chinese collectors would also sometimes stamp an acquired painting to show their ownership and refined taste. The seals may seem distracting at first, but for Chinese connoisseurs, seals provide an additional dimension and depth to the experience of viewing a painting. The mandarins realized well-placed seals could play a pleasing role in a painting's overall composition. However, they can also have the opposite effect. One particular emperor in the 18th century was so fond of his paintings, he was determined to place his giant seal in the middle of many masterpieces, defacing them forever with his imperial vandalism. He stamped the beautiful calligraphy of Wang Zixi, painted 1,500 years before. and the greatest landscape paintings. Fortunately, his officials were able to slip him some fakes from time to time and save the originals from defacement. But most Mandarins stamped their own paintings with taste and stamped ancient paintings out of respect to continue a dialogue with the ancient past. Chinese painting has maintained a remarkable continuity over the centuries. Because, for the Chinese Mandarin painter, the hard-won knowledge of ancient masters was not to be thrown away or wasted. It was a tradition to be cherished and emulated. Another factor which makes Chinese paintings look so unique is the set of tools used by the Mandarin artists. Known as the four treasures of the scholar's table, these tools were the primary materials for both calligraphy and painting. The first and most important of these four treasures is the brush. The Chinese brush is used for both writing and painting. In Europe, on the other hand, the quill pen on paper took over from the stylus and reed pen that the ancient Mesopotamians had used on their soft clay tablets. There was a clear division. Western painting went the way of the brush, while writing went the way of the pen. In China, there was no such division. And we have so, all, so many types of brushes. One stroke, you go to run from here to there. And has from goat, has from uh, also horse with goat inside. This is uh, a feather of a, of a bird. Uh, it's a horse hair, a horse hair, bear's hair. Uh, and this brush is made by the baby's hair. You know, the baby's hair, when the baby is born, say uh, about four or five days, you cut the hair, uh, and then you make this like this. Uh. So we keep this hair baby's hair brush until the baby is about 21 years old, then you give it to him as a present. It will be nice. The Chinese brush is a surprisingly high-tech little instrument composed of carefully selected animal hairs, which are formed into a conical clump and fixed into the end of a bamboo tube. The hairs in the brush tip form a reservoir 
that can hold enough ink to allow the drawing of long, continuous lines, which if the tip is held perpendicular to the surface, can move in any direction. By applying pressure and releasing it, the calligrapher can modulate the thickness of the line, allowing for more artistic expression. Chinese painters used the undulating line of calligraphy to express the first rule of Chinese painting, the transmission of the spirit. And so from the earliest times, the expressive line of calligraphy also flowed into the art of painting. Very few paintings of court artists of the great Tang dynasty of the 7th and 8th century remain. But in Shanxi province in western China, we can find the tomb of Princess Yongtai, who in the year 701, at the tender age of 17, was ordered to commit suicide by the evil empress Wu Zhetian. Although pillaged by robbers centuries ago, murals on the walls remain to show the good life the princess should have enjoyed and reveal the style of the court painters of the time. Here we can see the calligraphic line of Wang Zixue, with thick lines delineating the figures and thin lines describing the features of the girls. To this day, this expressive line painted with the versatile Chinese brush dominates Chinese painting. Mastery of the brush was essential, but so was a deep understanding of the ink. The Chinese say, the brush dances, but the ink sings. Around the time of Wang Zixu, the Chinese had developed an ink that made clear and durable marks on paper, which we call India ink because it was imported by the British via India. The French more accurately call it l'encre de Chine, or Chinese ink, the second treasure of the scholar's table. Chinese painters often used black ink washes to depict color. In fact, they had an expression that all six colors could be effectively expressed using black ink alone. This painting by a Buddhist monk entitled Persimmons shows an incredible mastery of the subtleties of ink to suggest color. This is the 13th century artist Lang Kai's Ink wash painted immortal. We see the painter's tonal range varies from the sheer black of the immortal's belt, painted with heavily saturated ink, to the light washes used to paint his robe. Brush and ink work together to convey the artist's spirit when painting this immortal. Mountains fading into the distance were rendered by washes of light ink or blue color alone, without preliminary outlines or modeling. The third treasure is paper, which was invented in China some 2,000 years ago. Before that, the Chinese wrote on thin strips of bamboo, which they would roll up into cumbersome scrolls. The emergence of calligraphy as an art was made possible by the use of paper as a medium because its absorbency enabled it to catch every nuance of the writer's touch more effectively than the bamboo surface. The fourth and final treasure is the inkstone, which is used as a surface to grind down an ink stick and mix it with water. A highly prized item, fine examples were passed from one generation to the next. We keep a lot of inkstones, like different type of inkstones, Ink stones, you must massage it every day. You see, you hold it and you massage. And you'll find when you, it, when, in the winter, when you rub it, rub it, very cold, the weather very cold, and the whole body sweat. Why? Because all these acupuncture points from your hand here, you massage, you touch it, and there's a relationship, a friendship, a love with the ink. So you see this, my biggest ink stone. Uh, I brought it back from China. I don't know how heavy it is. It is about, I don't know how many tons it is. Eh? The unique set of tools used by painters influenced the unique look of Chinese paintings. Their painting techniques 
also heavily influenced the look and composition of these paintings. Many Westerners assume that the Chinese painters had no grasp of Western realistic painting techniques, for if they had, they would have used them. For example, in the year 1804, one English visitor to China reported the Chinese were unable to pencil out a correct outline of many objects, to give body to the same by the application of proper lights and shadows, and to lay on the nice shades of color so as to resemble the tints of nature. Traditional Western painting utilizes a fixed point of view with linear perspective. This means these paintings contain a vanishing point, just where two train tracks, for example, meet on the horizon. Likewise, Western paintings employ a fixed light source to throw shadows. But the Chinese did understand and used these techniques. In fact, ever since the Sung Dynasty in the 12th century, there has been a school of Chinese painting that specializes in realistic techniques of perspective and color. This tradition was championed by the Emperor Hui Zheng, who hated the abstract landscapes so much favored by his father. In fact, he ordered them to be used to wipe up the mess in the painting studio. Hui Zheng advocated a strict representational realism. His court painters painted birds and flowers, exquisitely observed in enamel bright colors. It is a style full removed from the great landscapes of the 11th century. But many scholars thought the court painters were missing the point. Just as the Sung Dynasty painting presented a degree of realism never before matched, the famous scholar official, Su Shi, defended the great Mandarin abstract tradition of Wang Zixi and Fan Quan. One time, while correcting examinations, Su Shi was inspired to paint bamboo, but found himself without black ink. All that was available was the red ink used for correcting student exams. So he used this red ink to paint red bamboo. When he showed this red bamboo to his fellow painters at the academy, they laughed at him and mockingly asked, where in the world does bamboo grow red? The crafty Su Shi replied, and where in the world does it grow with the colors of black ink? And then he uttered his famous objection, those who discuss painting in terms of lifelikeness have the understanding of a child. This got him in trouble. His calligraphy was banned from the court of Huizong and his name posted in an official list of enemies. But later Chinese painters revered Su Shi as the champion of the abstract Mandarin painting tradition. After Su Shi, the opposing trends in Chinese painting history were set. From then on, the term Northern School was used to describe those who sought to paint outward appearance with bright realistic colors. And the term Southern School for those who sought to paint inner reality with black ink. The clash of these two schools is nowhere better illustrated than the story of when the Mandarins first saw a Western painting. In the year 1601, after a 20-year wait, European missionaries managed finally to get invited to the Forbidden City because the emperor had heard rumors that they bore fabulous gifts. One Jesuit brought a painting for the emperor, which would be the talk of the court. When he unveiled it, there was a large gasp. They had never seen anything so lifelike. The Mandarins were also impressed by this lifelike painting. But like Westerners, when they first beheld Chinese painting, they said it wasn't art, but rather the work of fine craftsmen. But the emperors had traditionally favored the northern school with its colorful, realistic style. And so, some missionaries actually became members of the Imperial Painting Academy. The most famous of these was Lang Xining, whose original name was Giuseppe Castiglioni. His eight prize steeds was depicted with near photographic realism thanks to sophisticated techniques of anatomy and perspective developed in Europe since the Renaissance. But the Mandarin artists remained unimpressed. 
Like Su Shi centuries before, they felt that these realistic techniques were merely methods of creating an optical illusion. They felt Western painting missed the point that the true reality of things lies behind the illusion of outward appearances. The Mandarin painters of China rejected representational realistic painting techniques because they failed to realize the first rule of Chinese art, to express the hidden reality behind the illusion of surface appearances. For example, in contrast to Western painting's utilization of a single fixed light source, one finds in Chinese painting a fluid interplay between light and dark with no single source of illumination. This approach, which may at first seem to reflect a lack of understanding of the physical properties of light, highlights the Chinese painter's emphasis on movement, vitality, and spirit. In addition, Mandarin painters rejected single-point perspective. Unlike a Western landscape, the painting is designed to be looked into rather than looked at. So there is no single vanishing point. Instead, the viewer's eye travels around the scenery like a traveler wandering on foot. Said one 11th century critic, all landscapes should be viewed from the angle of totality to see the totality of its unending ranges. In fact, many Chinese paintings adopted a moving perspective, a trick no still camera or fixed point of view painting could achieve. Chinese landscape artists would often incorporate different views of the same mountain into the same painting. So, how did they deal with the problem caused by putting different perspectives or views of the same subject right next to each other. Well, one way was to use mist or clouds to harmoniously integrate the different perspectives into a pleasing whole. A Chinese landscape artist wandered around a mountain or a garden and returning to his scholar's desk, closed his eyes to meditate. He called upon his cultivated memory and deep emotion to paint the mountain from the angle of totality. For the Mandarins, Taoist meditation and artistic creation were inseparable. The idea precedes the brush was their motto. The famous landscape painter Gua Xi, who painted this magnificent landscape early spring, said, Wonderfully lofty are these mountains, inexhaustible are their mystery. In order to grasp their creations, one must love them utterly and never cease contemplating them and wandering among them, storing impressions one by one in the heart. Then, in painting them, the eye will not be aware of the silk, nor the hand consciously wield the brush. In Western paintings, people tend to be the main subject of the painting, and landscape serves more as a backdrop. Now in Chinese painting, in contrast, the landscape tends to dominate, and people are tiny within it, part of the overall Taoist totality and flow of nature. We have to seek them out in the overall composition. When we do, we may find a solitary fisherman. A humble peasant walking through the mountains where he fits in inconspicuously, merging like a drop of water in the ocean of the Tao, the cosmic force that animates all things. or a Taoist sitting in contemplation on a rocky crag in the mountains. Oops, good thing he's immortal. The Mandarin's main purpose in painting was summed up beautifully by another famous landscape painter. He said, one approach to the Tao is by inner meditation alone. 
Another is through the beauty of the mountains and water. The beauty of Mount Hua, the very mystery of the dark spirit of the universe, all may be captured in a single picture. There is another reason why Chinese paintings look so unique, the subject matter. The various beautiful landscapes of China are found nowhere else in the world. Not only did Chinese artists look at the landscapes differently and use the tools of calligraphy to paint these landscapes, the landscapes themselves are different. Such as the great low soil central plains of China, eroded to create incredible craggy mountain peaks, or the great karst formations of the Guilin Valley along the Li River. The scholar artists developed a very sophisticated technical vocabulary of brush strokes to describe these various landscapes of China. Early in the 10th and 11th centuries, the great masters of landscape painting would paint the craggy holy mountains of northwestern China. To paint the surfaces of boulders and mountain faces of Mount Hua, Fan Quan used the raindrop texture stroke to convey the impression of a mountain worn by thousands of years of wind and rain. The artist, Guaxi, created the cloud top texturing effect that captures the nature of the misty mountain landscapes of central China. Chinese artists represented these different environments by creating new brush strokes and formats to describe their new surroundings. In the year 1127, Tartars from the north attacked and overran the Chinese capital at Kaifeng and destroyed the Imperial Painting Academy. Over 6,000 paintings, masterpieces all, were destroyed. But the court managed to flee to Hangzhou on the southeastern coast of China a setting that would change the course of Chinese painting forever. Ah, I found it. When the imperial court moved from Kaifeng in the mountains to Hangzhou in the Lake District, horizontal scrolls like this one began to become very popular because they were very suitable for showing the flat landscapes around the lakes. More popular, in fact, than the hanging vertical scrolls that have been used to depict mountains. Unrolling a hand scroll painting is a bit like watching a movie. A visual journey through space and time with constantly changing scenery. The moody scenery around Hangzhou inspired the scholar Xia Kui to paint pure and remote view of stream and hills. Painters like Xia Kui created new brush strokes to describe the landscapes around Hangzhou. Using the side of the brush and swept across to create triangular shapes, the axe cut stroke was perfect for painting the cliffs around the lakes. Rock faces are seemingly chiseled right out of the paper, their hard, solid textures as palpable as granite. Around Hangzhou, the scholar painters used different texture strokes to produce radically different visual and emotional effects. Huang Kung Wang's dwelling in the Fuchun Mountains provides a classic demonstration 
of the hemp fiber stroke, which are soft strokes to suggest earthy hills. Within the soft, moist texturing is an overflowing sense of life. So what does make Chinese painting so distinctive? Well, it's three things. The unique landscapes of China, the origins of Chinese painting in brush calligraphy, and the unique culture of the scholar-official artists that we know as Mandarins. Developed more than a thousand years ago and brought to perfection by generations of master painters, Chinese paintings are far more than simple representations of what the eye sees. They seek to depict the essence of the subject, not its external appearance. When viewing a Chinese painting, accept the invitation of the artist to explore with him his experience of the fantastic landscapes of China and pause to appreciate not only his skilled brushwork, but also the profound philosophies that inform his vision.